So let's talk about job, job authoring. So the key here is to make ETL job authoring like code development using your own tools. So it's almost the opposite direction of the ETL tools you know, I'm familiar with anyway, which are very much Canvas UIs and are oriented towards data scientists or IT staff. So I mean, those guys do that stuff well. There's no reason to you know, try to supplant them. I don't, but you know, what we're really focused on is the portion of the market where people aren't using them. So the basics of it is, is that you provide a source, you provide a target, and uh, we go and uh, you know, generate uh, code, Python code. It runs inside a Spark container, so it's scale out. Um, you can schedule a triggering condition like a calendar or a Lambda event or uh, you know, some other criteria like uh, pressure, like enough of these files have ended up inside S3, which you can do, again, using Lambda or some other trigger. And so this, at this level, you know, a lot of people, given the source and target, will generate a graph that looks like that. Let's dig in a little bit on how what we do. So what we're doing is we're generating Python. The graph is actually a bunch of annotations inside the Python, so when you edit it, you can add your own elements and annotations and update the graph, right? So, it's not, so those things can stay in sync. Obviously, if you mess it up, you know, the graph's not gonna make any sense. It's very much like Javadoc, right? You know, if you, you know, it's a, sort of a shared responsibility. If you provide the information, the graph makes sense, but at least you can edit, right? And editing is the core to this, so that you edit the pieces you need to, and we generate just the generic stuff that you want, like extract, error processing, et cetera. So we're running on PySpark, as you'd expect. We, ha we handle bad data and crashes, so bad data moves off into a bucket, and you can go and deal with it tomorrow rather than have your job fail and get paged in the middle of the night, as happens altogether too often. Um, and you know, it'll ad adapt to source schema changes, and you can specify whether you want the target schema to change or more likely you know, have that file also end up in the second location so that you can evaluate whether the next day you want to deal with that. And you know, we'll handle complex semi-structured data. So we can talk a little bit about that, what that looks like in a bit, minute. So, so I mentioned that we have human readable annotations that correspond to the ETL graph, so you can hear, see here that it, there's a type, there's a return, there are inputs to it, and there are a bunch of arguments, and you know, that basically is what I need to generate a graph, and in this case, it's basically saying, you know, make the object look like a data source element, and hey, it, there's nothing that's a predecessor, right? So, relatively straightforward. And beyond that, you know, we have the basic notion of frames in Spark, if you're familiar with Spark, but it's slightly uh, enhanced to support dynamic frames because the data, t the tuples actually change as you go from step to step in the transform. Um, and we deal with um, item potency. You know, these are the sorts of things that people don't code in when they're coding the happy path, right? And um, so item potency means that you know a job restart is going to pick up from where it left off rather than duplicate your data in their target system and you know mess it up. Um, We'll tag bad data so that we flag it and we don't crash the code, and we, you can choose to siphon the error tuples off into, at any step into an S3 bucket and you know, deal with it the next day. So let's look at a semi-structured schema and look at relationalization of it. So that's a very colorful chart. Um, anyway, so here, in this case, you know, you've got uh, something which is you know, a single value, a pair of values, a uh, structure with X and Y in it, and then an array. So what you'd want to have happen here is, is you'd want to have a table that contains A, B1, B2, C.X, C.Y, and then you'd want to pivot the, into a, a, uh, another table that has a foreign key primary key relationship to represent the array, because that could be arbitrary size, and you don't necessarily want to ally create um, columns for it. So we'll do this stuff on the fly, you know, basically flattening the structure so that you can support um, relational tables. We pivot the arrays, we modify the mappings as the source schema changes, and we'll modify the target schemas if you allow us to, um, which you 
may want if you trust the source data to not have errors, um, which you might for things that are coming from canonical sources like Twitter or Salesforce or what have you. So that's uh, clearly a developer screen because it's white text on a black background. And, uh, so, and you know, all it is here is a IDE, right? You know, maybe it's your favorite IDE, maybe it's one you hate, but you can choose to use whatever you want. So once we generate the code, we throw it into your preferred Git uh, repository. We push it to the repository when it's generated, it gets pulled when, uh, it, before the job runs. And in between, you can run your favorite IDE to edit it as you please, right? And that means you can add new information, you can uh, you know, add new steps and try the transform stop process and so forth, right? Here again, we try to leverage the community. Now, our take is, is that there are you know, a couple of million AWS customers at this point. Almost certainly somebody's already had to recognize your file or deal with a format or whatever. You know, maybe Netflix or Amazon has some interest in sentiment analysis on you know, comment fields, right? You'd think that they would. And you know, rather than having to crack open some data science book and do, write your own you know, human parser to you know, language parser to figure all of that stuff out and you know, do it from scratch, maybe I can borrow some code, assuming that people are willing to share. And I think, you know, the, my experience at least with AWS is a lot of the developers are happy to share. I mean, and then you can choose whether you want to or not. I mean, maybe if you're a bank, you want to share within the bank, but not, you know, with the broader community. But maybe if you're not, you know, it just gives you acceleration. And, you know, you can search for classifiers here, transforms here, scripts here. You know, we expect over time to add ranking, recommendations, reviews, all that, you know, all the stuff you'd expect, right, from, certainly from Amazon, you know, .com, right? Um, so I think that that'll help a lot uh, for people. And, you know, in particular, I think the world's getting complex, right? You might be, you might think, oh, I can write a, something that remove, that does sentiment analysis and then remove curse words and then I'm dealing with that for the English language and then it turns out that now my hotel site is supporting Turkey. I don't know Turkish. I don't know the curse words in Turkish, you know? And so, but probably somebody does. Maybe they've put something in. At least I should look at that first before I, you know, break out my Turkish to English uh, dictionary. <laughs> 